Hello, everyone out there. Welcome to Philosophy for Living on Earth, coming to you live from the Ayn Rand Institute. My name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow at ARI. This is a weekly video series exploring big questions about life in our world today uh, and proposals for answering those questions coming from the philosophy of Ayn Rand. Today, we have a special episode of our broadcast, thinking philosophically about the pandemic. Uh, typically, one of us will give a presentation and then we'll uh, have a question and answer session. However, uh, this has been a late breaking story and we have late breaking commentary on the pandemic that we are all now dealing with today. And so today's format is going to be a little bit different than usual. Uh, what we will begin with is a series of questions that I will be asking uh, our two uh, senior scholars with whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, I am going to encourage people who are watching on all of our channels, whether Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or Periscope, to submit questions. I'm going to be monitoring those questions. I'm not sure yet how many of them, uh, if, uh, if any, we'll get a chance to do. We, we are taking longer than usual today, a whole hour and a half. Uh, but if, if I see questions coming in that are uh, particularly germane and relevant to the things that we're discussing, I'm going to try to make room for them. So please, uh, if you're in Zoom, uh, hover over your screen, select the Q&A box on the bottom and submit questions there. That's where I'll be looking. Otherwise, if you're in the other social media channels, please uh, write your questions just in the comment sections on this video, and I'll be monitoring those as well uh, while I'm moderating the discussion with our two guests. So joining me today are two of our most senior and distinguished philosophers. Uh, I said something in the copy that I wrote about this that amidst the, uh, the, all the news, it's important to take a step back philosophically and think about how to process everything. And so speaking, I think, to our most distinguished philosophers is one of the best things that we can do. So with me today are Ankar Gatte, who's chief philosophy officer at the Ayn Rand Institute, and Greg Salmieri, who is a fellow with the Anthem Foundation and an instructor at Rutgers University. Welcome, Ankar and Greg. Hi. Ben. And I don't hear you yet, but hopefully... You can. Can you hear me now? Ben? I can hear Ankar, Ben. Yeah, I can I hear Greg. So. Ben, maybe your speakers or headphones oh, are, are, are off. We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, so let me, let me uh, actually stop sharing the screen so everybody can see all of us at the same time. And kick things off with a question about just from your perspective, what are we dealing with? What is the situation? What is the, what is the basic story and the basic facts about uh, this pandemic that we are now looking at? Oh, how do you want to start with that? Um, uh, yeah, I can say a bit. And it, this will be particularly from the US context. So I mean, I think the basic facts are known by everyone that this is a virus that is originated in China. Um, they had initial cases. They had when it was, and they had initial cases, they had a cover up of it, including, I think, going after the people exposing that we've got a new virus here. And it seems um, that it's causing a lot of damage. And, and in certain cases, it has a high death rate. It's, that there was cover up of that. Um, and from what I've read, information that was not shared with the rest of the world. Um, and then there was a greater outbreak in China. There were real authoritarian measures in a crackdown of, of requiring people not to go out. The, the pictures from Wuhan are the desert. I mean, this is a huge city, deserted streets, nobody out. Uh, they separated kids from their parents. I mean, so the real authoritarian measures. But it's, this is, it's a virus that transmits uh, fairly easily. It's a, it's a novel coronavirus. Coronaviruses, they're known. Uh, the, the way they transmit is known. So the idea that this is containable seemed dubious from the start. And from what I've read, many experts said, like, this is not, this won't be containable. People in the rest of the world have to start thinking about this. We have a new virus on the scene. Um, and then you saw spread in parts of Asia and then into Europe and particularly Italy, 
uh, dramatic increase in cases, stories coming out that that the the healthcare system is overwhelmed. Though even there, there's questions you can ask about that that we could talk about. But and then going into Spain and other parts of Europe, and then coming in uh, in the not then, but also the cases in the U.S. And I think one of the biggest things, I mean, that obviously everybody is talking about is the lack of testing in the U.S. And that has created tremendous uncertainty and I think has made it easier to now in the U.S. to pass things that people are modeling on China and Italy of these um, crackdowns and these these orders not to leave your house. I mean, Ben, you're in Orange County, you're on lockdown now. Um, and that the that 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 this is a plausible response, I think, in the US particularly, is so exacerbated by the lack of testing. Um, and I mean, we'll talk about that. But I think in terms of thinking about this whole thing, the lack of information, and what that leads to, I think, is a major thing to think about. So that's part of at least part of where we are. I don't know, Greg, you want to Greg, say? any thoughts on the same issue? Um, no, that's my understanding of what's happening here. The, the, um, the one thing is the, there are the, the fact that it spreads uh, efficiently between humans, my understanding, again, not a medical professional, uh, is not something you can infer from it being a coronavirus. So SARS and MERS were dangerous coronaviruses that don't spread efficiently between human beings. There are other coronaviruses uh, that are responsible for many of the common colds that do spread efficiently. And um, when SARS and MERS emerged some years ago, um, it caused a lot of uh, thought because these are from a family of viruses, some of which spread efficiently. But unlike the ones that spread efficiently, um, these were really deadly. And so this got thinking, what if the genes reshuffled? What if there was a coronavirus that both spread efficiently and had the lethality of the SARS or MERS. And this virus isn't um, as lethal, my understanding is, as those, but it spreads much more efficiently uh, than they do. And so we're not in the, the worst case scenario people worried about even for a coronavirus, but we're in a case scenario that people had envisioned um, years ago uh, when those viruses were a wake up call. There is an infectious disease uh, you know, community that experts on this and think about and prepare for pandemics. And there was a lot of work that was done on viruses of, uh, sorry, uh, vaccines and antivirals for coronaviruses at the time. But as um, those stories receded from the headlines about SARS and MERS, this work got discontinued, deprioritized, uh, and, uh, and seemingly preparation for this kind of thing was not taken as seriously as it needs to have been. And so it seems like the world and America in particular is caught up short now that this has emerged. Greg, let me go off something you said a moment ago, because when you prefaced your comment about the nature of this virus with the fact that you're not a medical professional. In fact, none of us are medical professionals. We're doctors of philosophy, but not of medicine. And so with that in mind, can you say, can either of you say a word or two about how a educated layman should be trying to process the the news and the stories and the variety of claims coming from different sources saying different things uh, in a situation like this yeah it, um a couple of thoughts i mean you have to think about and you have to think about before crisis times ideally um what are trusted sources of information and who are trusted experts? And if you haven't, you have to start thinking about it now. And it's not something you can work out all on your own. Um, that is, if you are not a doctor, you can't just look at some article that looks medical and judge this one's sound or this one isn't, or some guy who has MD after his name, is he one of the crackpots or one of the, the better ones? Um, because it takes special skills that take time to develop to make those kind of calls. So you have to um, rely to some extent on the kind of infrastructure there is in the society for credentialing people, for elevating people, uh, what are respectable medical schools, what are respectable organizations, right? And um, you need to not take that uncritically. You have to think about how good do I think my society is at, um, at medicine? 
how good do I think the mainstream information system in my society is at medicine? How good do I think the knowledge economy is here? And you have reasons to think it's pretty good, right? I mean, the death rates are relatively low. There are all kinds of things. You couldn't cure diseases yourself, but someone goes into the hospital and they come out and they're alive. There are reasons to think that our society and the institutions in our society that do this are very good, though maybe not as good as they could be, at getting to the truth on these matters. Uh, but you also have to think about what limitations are there on that knowledge, what things might you have to take with a grain of salt. And you're going to have to come to your own judgment on that. But you have to come to a judgment, I think, in large part on um, what is the in quality of the information system in my country, and then use that as a background for thinking about then particular, uh, particular experts you come across. And then what you want to be looking for is experts who um, are, uh, do have some kind of credentialing, uh, and then who explain things clearly in terms that you could understand, that give you reasons for what they're thinking, and that respect your context as somebody who's trying to understand a confusing situation, who is not an expert, and who needs to know how you can know what's true here and how you can know who to rely on. And so that tries to give you the information you need to tell those things. And also the, a big part of this is recognizing that, that as I said in, in a talk on uh, on thinking objectively, knowledge is work. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to the truth on this. There's a necessary division of intellectual labor. And you want experts that um, give signs that they are respecting that and that they are trying to provide you the service of distilling some of the work that they have done for you rather than providing you with revelations or orders. And I, I'd say, on particular on this issue, because I know all three of us, I think, have been reading, as I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have been reading a lot of stories in the news from the CDC about this. I think one thing on this issue in particular, but it's like any issue where it's developing, if the experts, they should be telling you, like, this is what I think based on what's happening right now and what the evidence is, and this is why I think it's pointing in this direction and indicating some degree of their certainty, but also indicating other people have different reads of what is going on. And so, I mean, one of the things is what's the death rate of this? And there's ranges and they can, it ranges quite a bit from, from closer to the flu to 1% to high to 4% and to get both, okay, there is this range and other experts disagree with me on this. And then also to indicate they, I mean, a real expert should indicate, this is why I think it's this and not those, though there may be some possibility it's higher or lower than what I'm thinking, but it's, but this is a developing story and you have to keep up with what is going on, but so does the expert. And there on this, there's going to be divergent views and you, the expert should be telling you that there are divergent views on this. Yeah, so I have a talk on how to be an objective consumer of science that's up on uh, ARI's webpage somewhere. Um, where I talk more about this, including on how to deal with experts disagreeing with one another. Um, so you're, you're going to have to make your assessment a relative to your understanding of, you know, do you think we're, we're a society that knows nothing about this and all the experts are flakes? Uh, well, then you think about how, why do you think that? Uh, but if you think that the medicine is a real science, there are people who really know things in it. The medical schools may have some problems, but they're by and large um, producing real knowledge and disseminating it. Uh, then you need to take that as part of the context for making this judgment. And you need to think about what is the work, who's doing it, and how are they all demonstrating objectivity in their functioning. In and part of that is uh, dealing with the fact that there are differences of opinion among qualified people. So that's, that's I think, some good uh, thinking on how to evaluate medical claims, but there are a lot of other claims Let that are me, circulating. One other point, about, I'm looking at the chat and I see that people are saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. You should just look at the facts and so forth. Okay. Um, if you, you say you should be concerned about what the state of knowledge is in the culture and so forth, you're being a traitor to reality. Reality doesn't just write itself on your mind and tell you what's true. That's mysticism. If you want to know what reality is, if you want to know what's true about things that aren't perceptibly evident to you, like about what the rate of contagion of a certain virus is, what the death rate will be, 
um, what drugs are and aren't effective, what policies are and aren't having what effects, right? You need to do a lot of work to figure that out, work of gathering evidence, work of assessing and integrating that evidence, worth, uh, work of formulating theories and testing the theories. That is work that needs to be done to know what's true. Reality doesn't just write itself on your mind like a mystical revelation. And if you think it is, you're BSing, does, you're BSing yourself. Um, and then the question is, can you do all that work yourself? Sometimes you can. But in many cases, you can't. It would require years of specialized education. And you can't get that in the 10 minutes that you need to decide whether to go to the restaurant or not, or whether to take this drug or not. Um, so you have to rely on division of labor, just like you do in anything else. And then what being rational in the context of a division of labor information economy means is assessing your sources. And then how do you assess your sources? And that's what we're talking about how to do. So moving then from assessing medical sources to uh, sources for other kinds of claims, as I was uh, about to ask before, there's all kinds of claims circulating about not just the nature of the disease, but uh, where it came from and uh, uh, whether, you know, what our government is doing to deal with it and what their motives are in dealing with it. Uh, I think that, Greg, you had wanted to say a little bit here about uh, some of these uh, kinds of conspiracy theories. Um, what kind of, oh, the, um, sorry, I got distracted for a moment. Say, say again. What well, I was just looking at your notes about the, uh, the claims about whose fault it is and uh, what, what, you know, what, what the FDA's motives are. Well, one thing is you just have to take care against believing things on insufficient evidence because they support or cohere with some element or other of your worldview, whether that's your philosophical worldview, you're an objectivist and you want uh, the government to, you know, you, you're very pro-freedom. And um, if this crisis is as bad as some people think it is, that seems like we have to limit freedom. So you want to think that it's not as bad as some people think it is, or you're a collectivist and you want to think it's worse so that you can have an excuse to impose controls, or then more narrowly, your political preferences. You uh, you hate Trump, and so you want to believe anything that puts as much blame as possible on him, or you hate, uh, or you you love Trump and are offended by people doing that, and so you want to believe anything that you know makes him as unculpable as possible. Um, there are some facts about all these things. What did Trump do or not do? How bad is the virus? What different political measures will have what effect? And what's right or wrong here? But you want to think about: Are you believing things because you want to? Are you excited about this article that says things are worse or better in this or that respect than you might have thought because it um, lets you rest content with what you thought before, lets you not ch check certain premises of yours, or are you really trying to tell what's true here because you love your life and you love reality and you want to know what you need to know to function well in it? Uh, so beware of believing things too quickly. And there are obvious versions like this, like, you know, it's a hoax uh, or... Um, uh, whatever that people fall into, which I think are crazy. Um, but there are also more subtle ones that I think are um, uh, more attractive to people who are intellectually sophisticated. So for example, if you know, and I think we have knowledge of this, that government controls and things like the FDA and the CDC, or some of the things the CDC does, having the government control the medical industry uh, in all the ways it does, leads to slowness, inability to respond, inflexibility, and so forth in times of crisis, and so creates things like shortages. It's natural to go from that general knowledge to specific conclusions like um, there's some drug available now from some company that we would all have if not for the FDA preventing us from getting it. But that's a leap that I don't think you can make uh, I don't think is reasonable, or the reason we don't have a vaccine right now, we could have a vaccine tomorrow if only the FDA did this, or only the CDC did that. That's not the way force works. If you as a layman can tell that if the FDA just did this tomorrow, suddenly the pandemic would be solved and everybody would get the drugs they need, um, the people at the FDA would figure that out too and do it. They're not uh, tooling their mustaches trying to figure out how to kill people. They're in a panic now. The way force works is that it uh, long-term prevents new drugs from being developed. It's, it's as a result of it, there are fewer things in the pipeline. People aren't ready to scale up production in the way they could be if industry was prepared for this and investment markets were free over the last 10 years. Uh, now, if you're an industry if you're an expert on the industry, you might be able to see some specific thing that could be done if only this law was um, 
repealed. But you have to know something about it. And I'll make a few suggestions on uh, things I think the government could be doing based on doctors I've been talking to and who are telling me this thing is hampering my ability to treat patients or that thing is hampering my ability to treat patients. But um, you have to take that kind of information with, uh, you know, uh, it, with a view to where it's coming from. There's no, um, I think, government policy that's a panacea in in a time of crisis like this. Uh, if we want to understand the role of force here, it's largely in my view, in getting us into a situation where we're uh, paralyzed in our ability to react uh, rather than having more uh, more um, options in line. Let's talk a little bit more about government and about political philosophy in general. So there are a ton of questions coming in right now about what we think the proper role of government in dealing with pandemics is, and I definitely want to get to those and I definitely want to spend some time on them. but. Before we do that, I think, again, it's important to take a step back and ask some more general questions about the role of thinking about politics philosophically in understanding what's going on in, uh, in the present situation. And I know there were some points about uh, political philosophy and about ethics that uh, both of you wanted to discuss uh, in connection with this before we get into the quarantine stuff. Uh, thoughts? Um, I'll say something on the some of the political issues. And one of the things that you have to keep, I think, alive in your mind, if you're on the side, as I mean, we at the Institute are, we're on the side of capitalism, of laissez-faire, of thinking of it from the perspective of if you had a proper system of government, how what would happen here? What would be the forces at work? And in a pandemic, in this kind of case, how do you, what would operate? What would private enterprise do? What would government do? What kind of collaboration would there be between private enterprise and government? When you're in a context that we are in today, that um, uh, many industries have massive government presence in them, and healthcare is one of the ones that has the most. I mean, the financial system and healthcare, the two that are in. Um, dire straits in certain ways. They're both heavily impacted by government. And if you're thinking now in this context, what should the government do? It's not, particularly in the short term, it's not a solution to say, well, we should have laissez-faire capitalism. And there are better and worse things I think a government can do in this context and in regard to healthcare. And you need to think those through thinking they're not ideal. So from a long range perspective, this is not where I want to end up. But in the short range, it's not just all, well, there's force in healthcare, so there's nothing we can do. And there's nothing either to criticize the government for what it's doing, or thinking, no, this is good of what it's doing. And that you have to keep those connected, but keep that they're separate still, they're different aspects of thinking about this total situation. And, and we want to talk and we should talk and i'm sure there's a lot of questions about what the government should be doing now and what we think about these lockdowns and so on but a way to think of it is i mean imagine you're on a bus and it's a public bus in a city the government runs it and the brakes go out and the bus is out of control and the driver is trying to get the bus safely to a place and you're trying to figure out what to do um you can think about the fact that this is a government-run bus and private industry maybe would have better safety standards and but you don't say well the driver should just jump out the window because he's a government employee and let the bus crash when no one else knows how to drive the thing on it right now if there happens to be a guy who knows how to drive the bus better and you, but you um you have to separate out questions about what wrong government policies got us into this kind of mess that we want to correct worked hard to correct afterwards when we're understanding the causes of this mass and how we need to reform society in light of that and particularly how we want to combat the people who are going to draw the wrong lessons from it but during the crisis you also have to think about okay it's a government a lot of these things are right now government functions like steering the bus is a function of this government employee how should he do that job better uh to save us in the short term because it's uh there's you'd have to think about the short term and the long term and in an integrated way, as Ankar said. And uh, Ayn Rand makes a point that I think is important in terms of thinking about a mixed economy. This is in an article called a question of scholar, or the question of, or a question of scholarships, that you have to distinguish between things the government's doing 
that are things that need to be done and in a private, in a more private free system, private individuals would be doing and things that it's illegitimate that the government or anyone else would be doing. So, and this relates to thinking about the FDA, the CDC and so on. I think for these organizations, there's things they do that would be done in a free market and in a free system, but they would be done, some of them privately and some by government. So the idea that you have to test drugs, that's something that would happen in a free market. It wouldn't happen through one government agency and FDA. It would be private labs and private certification. So there'd be a lot of things that would, but the, the fact that there's testing going on, that's not some illegitimate function or public education to take something outside of this crisis. Education is a legit, legitimate thing. And you have to think, okay, when it's all public, there's still things to be said about how it should be run and better and worse things versus just saying, well, this shouldn't exist at all. And the CDC in particular, government would track pandemics. They would be concerned about bioterrorism. These are things that are, they have national security implications and a legitimate government would do this. And so then you have to try to figure out what's going on that's more and less legitimate within these organ these. Uh, and it's worth saying a word about why having any role in infectious disease is a proper function of government. Um, infectious diseases are things that can physically harm one person that emanate from another person. So if you have an infectious disease and you're going about and spreading it to people, right, you are uh, perhaps unwittingly initiating force against them. It would be like if you had a, a mental illness whereby you threw daggers and you walked around doing it, right? So this is, a, a and if there wasn't a government, people would have to, uh, figure out who was doing that and stop them by force in as an act of self-defense. So whenever you have something that's an issue of uh, self-defense, which has to be done by force, uh, it's the job of government to bring that under objective control, to create clear rules for how it's going to be implemented and to uh, stop the situation where you have people feeling the need to resort to force willy-nilly. Um, so that's why some kind of tracking of infectious disease, some kind of rules for what to do when a disease is dangerous enough or infectious enough and so forth, is something within the purview of the government. There are a lot of questions about how it should work and uh, the legitimacy of specific measures that are being taken now, some of which, many of which I think are clearly illegitimate. But the that there's some government function here, I think, is, uh, is legitimate. Well, let's let's drill down into that last point then, Greg, because we're, we we have gotten really a, a plethora of questions from people uh, on the current policies. Uh, Sam on Zoom, for instance, asks: Are the reactions of national, state, and local governments justified and appropriate? And we have other people asking questions because they're living in places uh, where there are lockdowns or things close to that. Uh, we have uh, Tom on Zoom asking whether this is an interference with the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Thoughts on current policies from both of you? So I would say um, I think most of the things, the coercive measures the government, the, or the, the governments in the U.S. are doing, are not warranted. But that's not to say that some there couldn't have been a good explanation and it executed in a proper way. But I think the way it also, the way some of these are done don't make sense. Um, I think in this kind of case, the focus, the primary focus should have been on the, so there's vulnerable populations, elderly and some people with so, so, what I mean, what they call pre-existing conditions. Diabetes seems to be one that it makes you particularly susceptible to serious complications from this, including, I mean, worst case scenario, death. And that the it's proper to get out the information to urge social distancing to, I mean, so we can talk about the issue of flattening the curve. And so, there, so there's a lot of things that I think that should have been happening um, and on a voluntary basis. When you start getting the forced lockdowns, that's a different situation and it's I think it's a high bar that a government has to pass to do this and to do it properly um, so so one that it's legitimate to think we need to do this and then how do you do it in a legitimate way 
once you think, yeah, this is needed. And if the focus were more on isolating the vulnerable population rather than everyone else has to take drastic and drastic steps, and if you don't do it voluntarily, then we're going to impose forced and coercive lockdowns. I think the primary, there's a question of whether that would have been enough to focus more on you need to isolate the elderly, you need to isolate the vulnerable. Um, but even for coercive measures, I would, I think you have to begin there. It's you coercively isolate the elderly population. So if, it, if the this flattening the curve is partly that you don't want to overwhelm the healthcare system. And I think there's some legitimacy to that, though again, I think the way the whole issue was approached is not right, but it's a legitimate issue to be thinking about. And if you're going to try to flatten the curve, part of it is the people who are gonna get most sick, who are gonna need the most care, need to be in critical condition. It's you wanna limit them coming into the hospital, them getting the disease in the first place. And if you have, first it's voluntary trying to isolate them, but then if it, you really think it's coercive, I think it had to begin there, not with the lockdown on the economy and, or parts of cities or whole counties as in Orange County and sort of grinding productive life, but more widely just day-to-day -day life to a halt because of the worries about, and I mean, real worries of overwhelming the healthcare system. Greg, did you want to say anything about that? A few things. I mean, there's, there's I think, and a tendency to to um, not value freedom and not value productive work in people's lives that make people make government officials very cavalier and surprisingly cavalier. I mean, just how cavalier and how quickly to say nobody can go to work. All children have to remain home from school. Um, you know, the, the cost of doing and maintaining this kind of thing over time is astronomical. I don't just mean the economic cost, but economics is one way of measuring the overall impact on life um, of, of doing this. And it's going to, I mean, stopping everybody from working and living their lives kills a lot of people, right? And there's not a lot of thought taken in the panic mode, it, it seems, or if there is a lot of thought, it's not being expressed by the political leaders about what are the consequences of this? Is this cure um, worse than the disease? And um, it's a very serious limitation on people's ability to live. Now, you can, you can contract uh, some freedom for a short period of time in an emergency, but there's a, a uh, because what you're doing is protecting freedom by, do, by eliminating freedom of motion, you're protecting people's lives and there are emergency powers that are, that are legitimate. But I think a part of what justifies those powers is there being short term and there being a clear explanation about why on what basis they're being instituted and for how long. Now, maybe we don't know. Maybe the situation is we don't know how long we're going to have to do this containment to flatten the curve in a given city and what the result of it will be. But then you could have a measure that says we're doing this for one week in order to get information about how to proceed further. We'll have further announcements in a week. This is the metrics we're using to make these decisions. Uh, we recognize we stop using language like this is a big inconvenience to people and so forth as though it's just, oh, you don't get to... Um, you know, I don't know, uh, as though it's a trivial matter. We're upturning your lives. Uh, we think this is necessary because there's a, a real catastroph catastrophic situation possible here, and we don't yet know how to deal with it. But we think we have a, a one-week plan to develop a further plan, and at, you know, uh, and at the end of that, we'll announce what we're doing. Uh, and here's why we think taking this one-week hiatus from regular life will uh, help us be in a position to make better decisions later. But we're not getting that kind of clarity from leaders about what they know, what they don't know, why they're doing what they're doing, and uh, what justifies the kind of tremendous imposition that in many places there's being in life. It could possibly be justified in some cases, but you'd have to um, really be clear about that, clear about why you're doing it, and clear about the standards on which it's being judged. So are there specific steps that we, we've talked about a bit now about what the government is doing that they perhaps shouldn't be doing or what they're not doing well, at least. Are there steps that either of you could recommend that they should be doing that would, uh, that would make the situation better? 
I mean, I'd say one on the, so the on the issue of testing, um, and this for me relates to the the that in this kind of case, government has to be brutally honest and completely transparent. So if you take seriously that government is your agent, there it's your representative. Your agent or representative can't keep information from you. Now, in a context of war, there's, okay, there's issues of secrecy. So here we're de dealing with a virus. There's no reason for to keep information. It, they have to make crystal clear in the way that the Supreme Court, when it passes a decision, it doesn't just say yes or no, or this, we're upholding this or we're overturning it. It gives detailed explanation for why this is the decision being reached. And in these kinds of cases, that when the, the, the government is demanding incredible power and that we have to take um, highly unusual and actions that interfere with people's lives, there's such a high burden that it explain what it's doing and why it's doing. And in regard to testing, part of it would have had to been, we've screwed this up. We've completely, and not all the reasons for it and we're launching an investigation, that can come later. But to say, we've screwed this up, this is our plan for testing and a real explanation of like, this is how bad it is. This is what we're gonna to try to do now. It's gonna take two weeks or three weeks that we're able to test in the way that we really need to be able to test and be completely forthright that it is, yeah, I mean, we shouldn't be in this situation, but the fact is we are now. And then we have to think, what do we do now that we're in this bad situation that we shouldn't be? Uh, shouldn't be? So one in regard to testing, that it's even if they screwed it up, the way that the screw up is being handled is really bad, I think. Um, and it's, oh, no, tests are available or they're going to be available any day and so on. And that doesn't seem anywhere close to the reality when you read about the stories or you talk to doctors about it. Um, and then on the issue of this flattening the curve. So this issue of you, if, if there's a huge spike in cases that will overwhelm the healthcare system and that we need to flatten this. There's, you have a line on these graphs of what the healthcare system is capable of. So what its capacity is. And in terms of thinking about production, it, I think the major focus of the government should not be, we, we're gonna halt um, individual citizens productive activities. You can't go to work or you have to telecommute. If you're not able to telecommute like restaurants and so on, you close. Um, in, there should have been the focus on how do we get the healthcare system, since it's so government run, how do we increase the capacity so that we can deal with more and more cases and that that's the focus of what the government's doing, not telling everybody else to stop doing stuff, but rather this is our plan to dramatically ram up in the best way that we think we can the capacity of the healthcare system. And then you may have had private enterprises telling you, well, there's even better ways you could try to do this and so on. But that should have been the focus. I think. And we should be thinking about ways to decontrol, not add control, um, in order to get that ramping up. Um, in, in a crisis, you might need to control people's movement sometimes to stop a spread. But the focus should be on looking for ways where freeing things up helps. Uh, and there are obvious ways where it does. So here are a couple. Um, and some states have done this, right? So there are all kinds of restrictive medical licensures where if you're licensed in one state, you can't practice in another. How about removing those? Massachusetts, it seems, has done that. Uh, some other states have. So doctors can move to where they're most needed and where they think they can do the most, uh, the most work. Um, uh, other ki any kind of things that are uh, preventing people who are plausibly qualified to do this work uh, from doing this work and that are present preventing hospital administrators, doctors, et cetera, from using their own judgment about who might be qualified to do this work. So if there's somebody uh, who can be taught to do, you know, some minor procedure quickly, even though they don't have whatever training or credential, the doctor should be able to train them and get them to do it. Whatever kinds of things like that can be done. Second, um, rem um, second making any kind of uh, doctors uh, able to use whatever kinds of experimental drugs they might want to be using, off-label uses, um, different things that they judge to be uh, effective that aren't. Uh, I think um, in, in uh, most cases, um, 
uh, I think there's some overestimating of what kind of effect that would have, because I think the real problem is that there's not fast enough production of the drugs that are needed. But uh, any kinds of lessening of restrictions on ways in which people produce drugs also, not just the doctors can use them, uh, not just the FDA restrictions, but restrictions on um, shipping, production conditions, anything like that. Um, here's a major one that emergency medical doctors who I've spoken to have uh, stressed the need for that was not done, at least as of this morning. Uh, there's a law, MTELA, the Emergency Medicine and Labor Something Act, right, which is a law passed in the 80s that um, requires a, an emergency room can't turn someone away without doing a test on, without triaging them basically properly. So you have to screen someone before you turn them away. And this was to prevent hospitals from not treating people who couldn't pay. Um, but what's happening now is in pandemic, in crisis times, it has emergency rooms overwhelmed. And the doctors can't say, you know, if you just have a, a stuffy nose and a cough, leave. We're not going to test you. Only stay if you have these features. They can't do that. They have to actually see each patient individually, and they're overstrained and they can't do it. Uh, there are actually provisions in the law where that could be suspended, and the first step of suspending it is the president declaring an emergency, which he's done. But there are other steps. They've not been taken, and so uh, triage nurses are overwhelmed and not able to function properly. And uh, this, this I think, needs to be uh, needs to be um, repealed. Uh, and then I think the most important one, probably, is removing any kind of restrictions on producing, marketing, and selling tests, including to the general public. People should be able to make tests, buy them, send them. If people make snake oil tests or BS tests or bad tests. Uh, so be it. The better pe the doctors will be able to find the better ones and recommend them. We have plenty of information services where we can tell which ones are credible and which ones aren't. And the uh, any kind of blocks to people producing tests. My understanding is that the test is is fairly easy. Um, this has already been this last change has already been done. But most hospitals or many hospitals are capable of doing this test internally in a couple of hours. And only a few days ago were they allowed to do that. They're actually banned. Uh, from doing it. Now they can, but um, so that's good, but that should have been, I mean, that law should have never been in place that prevented it in the first place. And it should have been one of the first things overturned when there was any um, any worry about, about this disease. But what about home testing? The Gates um, Foundation is trying to provide home, home tests in the Seattle area. There are probably other people and companies that could get these out and market them um, fairly quickly. And we should think about and ask those people what what um, what things are limiting their ability to do this, and are there any uh, hurdles or constraints on them that can be removed? I think it's worth pointing out, uh, Greg, because of the the restrictions on testing that you you mentioned before, that a lot of the numbers that we're right now seeing of increasing cases in the U.S. are there there they're happening because we're only starting to test people. A lot of these people have been sick to begin with and we're only ramping out the tests. And so it's hard to know uh, if what we're seeing is a, a exponential growth in cases or if it's just exponential growth in testing and it could be both, but it, the, the fact that there's been uh, just no transparency and that these laws have stopped us from getting this crucial knowledge have, have made things worse. And have you know contributed to the to the to the uncertainty and to the fear and the hysteria that that people have. In general, I think the bigger effect of force in medicine than um, than uh, a particular you know this drug is there, but we can't get it because the FDA won't let us have it right now. The the bigger effect of force in medicine, and I think the really serious one, is the effect it has on what things are produced in the first place and what knowledge is available. I think the people at the FDA, at all these organizations, are now in a panic mode. They're trying to do whatever they can, including lifting regulations or suspending them when they think they can do it. Like in Atlas Shrugged, in the panics, mm -hmm. the regulators call up Dagny and say, what can we do to help, right? And they're willing to get out of our way for the time being. The, the real problem isn't that they're not doing that, although there are probably some more of that that they should do. It's the effect of having had this system for so long that have stifled what drugs are being produced. So for example, there's um, a treatment uh, from, um, what's the name of the company? Um, uh, I'm forgetting it, but anyway, there's a, 
uh, a, a a promising treatment that is uh, being you know relatively ready for testing that uh, from um, Regeneron that's being kind of scaled up and there's worries that the FDA isn't letting people have it. There are probably other companies like this too, but as I understand it, the here the stumbling block right now isn't the FDA. They're producing it as fast as they can produce it. Um, they were originally going to give it to medical first responders, uh, sell it to them first, which is probably the right thing to do. Um, and they're going to call that a clinical trial that meets whatever FDA standard. So here the, 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 the bottleneck seems to be that they can't make the drug fast enough um, rather than that they're not allowed to. But then why aren't they able to make the drug fast enough? And why haven't they made and approved this drug five years ago when there was uh, knowledge that this kind of drug could be useful in this kind of a case, right? And, and so forth. Now, um, or why didn't they develop the system to, um, uh, you know, to, to scale it, uh, this way in case of a pandemic? It's those kind of things that I think are the real deadly effect of government control of medicine, that having it endemic in the system, government control, kills flexibility, drives the best people uh, out of it. Um, I mean, Harry's saying online that they can license production to other businesses, but we don't know that that's true. Apparently, it's very difficult to produce this. It takes time to ramp up production, uh, and they are uh, trying to do these kinds of licenses. So it, it takes work to get knowledge. It takes work to produce things, and we can't always create everything we need in the moment on the dime. That's the problem with the government controls that they prevent our ability to plan ahead, to think ahead and do that. Of course, if there are whatever restrictions there are preventing this should be removed and they should be able to do these things as quickly as possible. But I think the real way in which uh, the lack of freedom we have in medicine kills us is in stifling research and stifling flexibility. Why is it that we were not prepared for this kind of crisis when so many doctors knew that it was a possibility? Is it because we don't have enough of a command and control economy in uh, in medicine where the government can direct it? Obviously not, because the the countries that have stronger command and controls, more socialized economies, are no better and seemingly worse at it than we are. We'll see as time goes. So what is the reason? It's because if you had the view, which was a minority view, that a priority thing to do was to be building vaccines and preparedness and ways to scale things in case of a novel coronavirus pandemic, you can't really pursue that as policy without getting the whole government to agree with you. You have to go through a political process. Whereas if this were a free market in medicine, some subset of investors would agree with you. You would be able to get funding to do it. You would be a lot more exploring of different options. There would be a lot more knowledge created, and there would be a lot more contingency plans made by insurance companies, by different people who are able to who are able to have their minds functioning, including functioning about um, including functioning about uh, planning for contingencies. But all of that is shut down, right, or, or vastly constricted by the fact that every country in the world has mostly socialized medicine, including the United States. And what that means is that many of the best minds are driven out of the field. The ones that are there are shackled and unable to think creatively and flexibly. And most importantly, even if the doctors themselves are, the kind of entrepreneurship in the field that would enable massive scaling, massive pivots, uh, massive uh, creative uses of infrastructure is all not there. And it's not there because there's a gun to the mind of the medical profession. I think I'd like to pivot slightly to a, a, a broader topic uh, because I, I'm seeing a number of questions related to this coming up and I wanna to try to condense them all together uh, into a question about uh, mob psychology and, and hysteria, which seems evident everywhere right now. And I'm curious if, if you would both offer some thoughts on what explains it. Is it, is it a consequence of the, some of the kinds of policies that you were just talking about, Greg? Is it an aspect of our culture? Is it both? What has led us to the situation? Or is this something that's just inherent in human nature whenever you're in a situation like this? So I think there is such a thing as fear of the unknown. Um, 
And so this is part of the, re the, the more that there was information about this, I think this is part of the, what the testing, the, the lack of testing. It's unknown how many cases there are. So the death rate, it, it, what was we were talking about before, the, I mean, the, the range is so wide of what they think. Now, it's hard to figure this out, but without data, you can't figure it out at all. And the, and this is partly that the, there's no test is that it's so centralized so that if there's a screw up at the CDC, there's no testing for the whole um, nation, even though there all the kinds of university labs and so on knew how to test. And there's differences even in what tests they use and so on, but they think this is adequate or better. And this is what we want to use. They can't use that. So the, the fact that there's not testing is connected um, to the fact that there's government control of the healthcare system. And in that kind of environment then lends itself to um, all kinds of exaggeration, panic, hysteria. Um, and then I think in regard to healthcare, the more you socialize it, the more it's, you're not really responsible. You don't have to think too much about it. It's paid for for you. Go to the doc. They'll tell you what to do. So particularly in healthcare, there's a mentality that um, we need to be told what to do. And you tell you tell us to stay home and we'll stay home. You tell us not to work, we'll not, we'll not work. Now, I think Americans more than anywhere else will rebel against this kind of thing. So I will be surprised if this can, there's long-term, there can be these lockdowns of whole counties and millions of people. But it's, I think you'll see it, you see it much more in healthcare because it's been so socialized for so long that this is just your expectation that government runs everything, decides everything. There's basically no prices in healthcare. I mean, I have insurance. I have no idea when I go to the doctor what my bill is going to be. I never object to it because I don't know. Sometimes it's probably too high. Sometimes it's probably too low. I can, it's never the same, even for the same procedure. And it's you can't figure it out at all. And you sort of give up, respond like it's OK. I don't have a real decision making and power here. And so in particular, in this kind of environment, when you have no information, it's panic and tell us what to do. Oh. There's also a real, and there are a lot of people to blame for this, um, crisis of credibility and trust in um, people who should be in leadership positions. Uh, and this includes um, political leaders, but also major media institutions. We're in a time of um, of real a real credibility crisis in the country. Um, I don't think um, people respect the government, and there's a lot of skepticism about major institutions in the country uh, in ways that they're are predictable given how um, welfare status the country has become. But um, we, we've been, I think, going in the a worst direction on this in the last a couple of years. I don't think people have any confidence in the character of the president, of most governors and mayors, if they even know who they are. You could imagine a situation in which whatever your differences with the political leaders, you thought these were um, serious, high-minded people. And uh, if they put out, and they uh, and they really were serious, high-minded people, whatever they were mistaken about, and they um, put out messages saying, you know, we're urging people to take these steps. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Um, uh, these aren't coercive, but we really urge you not to leave the house because of this and that reason and so forth. And people would trust them because they had built uh, a reputation for trust and, uh, and so forth. And that is not the case here. Um, we, uh, starting especially with Bill Clinton, we started thinking it doesn't matter the character of our president. And um, we've had some, uh, I, I mean, I think Trump, I don't think anybody re actually respects him. I think some people like him and some people don't, but I don't think anybody trusts or respects him. Um, and, um, and then many people don't trust and respect the media. And many of the media institutions don't deserve trust and respect, although some do. Um, and, um, we're in a stage where there's... Uh, you know, just people don't know, you know, in a kind of situation like this, there'd be some panic anyway, but there's aren't voices who are well positioned 
to, to comment and provide authoritative calm information and recommendations about how to proceed to, to function as leaders morally. And that is um, something that I think we have to think about uh, in America, like that, that, that we need people to earn that, um, that position and we need to be looking for people who can earn that position. And I don't think, uh, I don't think we, we have enough uh, at least not that are respected by large enough portions of the population. And a lot of people are stepping up uh, on smaller scales trying to fill that gap. You see um, there are um, some really good doctors who are out there um, making their views known and recommendations. Uh, Amy Shadalja, who's a friend of us, of, of all of ours here, uh, I think has been doing fantastic work in this. There are a lot of people who have followings with different audiences who are trying to spread those messages. And I think just if I think about Amesh, she's on all of these major news shows, but also people like Dave Rubin, Sam Harris, uh, et cetera. He's been on some uh, Yaron Brooks show. People who maybe have different audiences uh, um, who, uh, you know, that might, you know, not know who to trust or be less uh, inclined to trust uh, stuff they're hearing from elsewhere, trying to get that message out to them. And I think there are people in other political um of other political persuasions, likewise trying to find the best experts and, and bring them out. Um, so I think there are people who are trying to um, uh, take that kind of moral leadership role, but we have not had enough of it, I think. Uh, our, what is the way, our, our moral leadership capital in the country, I think has been very much degraded over the past decade. And um, I think we are, we are uh, paying for that now. I, I think it's arguable that at least a at least a sizable portion of the hoarding behavior that you've seen recently is much more due to fear of being locked down than it is to fear of the virus itself. And so people wonder, well, why is all the toilet paper disappearing? What does it have to do with the uh, with the virus? Because it doesn't. And well, the answer is because they think they're going to be stuck in their their home for several weeks, not knowing what the government is going to do. Uh, I don't think that's the only reason for it, but I, th I definitely think it's a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, I put that as part of the fear of the unknown. So the, right. the fear of the unknown about the virus and what it really is and how it transmits and how deadly it is and how, how much is it already here in the US. And then, yeah, it's for sure fear of the unknown of what the government's going to do. And if they never explain anything, which is part of what is going on, then it, that so much exacerbates because they're going to do stuff and we have no idea what or why. And that is, that's a recipe for disaster. On the issue of, of isolation, uh, Ankar, you mentioned earlier that we should be doing this specifically um, with the older and more vulnerable. Um, Amesh Adalja has called this cocooning, uh, cocooning the vulnerable populations. Uh, I know this is what the, the British government is recommending more than the kind of aggressive social distancing we're seeing in America. Um, Harry Binswanger on, online is saying the elderly must take responsible for their own isolation. And I think it's true. Everybody has to take responsibility for um, what they're doing here. But the elderly who are most at risk have to take the most responsibility for protecting themselves rather than expecting the world to, to turn on them. Um, I think part of why there's an issue of, of really being um, there's such a panic about this and there's just real reason for concern but not for panic is that um, there's an issue of overloading the healthcare system uh, not having enough hospital beds having the hospitals just be slammed and then it's not just the the most vulnerable who are at risk but people can't get normal medical services um, if the healthcare system isn't functioning I don't know why my video is not uh, working I'm trying to get it back up um, but one thing that I do think is a, is a real um, factor in people not taking seriously the um, needing for the elderly to take a large share of their responsibility for isolating themselves um, and for recognizing that uh, policies that are, as Ankar said, you know, focus on them because they're the ones who are at risk is the altruism and egalitarianism that's so rampant in the culture. So all burdens have to be shared equally. We can't uh, ask for a, an old person to undergo more than, than young people do and so forth. Um, and I just would, do either of you have thoughts on the role of that in the crisis? I mean, I think it's, it's, yeah, there's a major altruistic element. It's not the only thing that's going on. And I think of it as, it's part of what explains the 
kind of lackadaisical attitude of what the full consequences are of these lockdowns. <clears throat> so part of what altruism teaches you, and particularly if you're functioning morally, and if you think here, like where it's a time of crisis, you need leadership. And if the better person thing, you need moral leadership. So what altruism tells you is to focus on the needy, the vulnerable, those who are about to die. That's your whole focus. That's your whole concern. And if you can slow that or eliminate that, that's what morally you have to do. And it's if to the extent that you have to sacrifice other things, you don't really even think about that in terms of more. They're not, that's not what counts. This is what counts. And so that it creates that there's not nearly enough discussion of the lives that are being harmed by these policies. And harm doesn't just mean being dead. If you can harm someone if, if you're, you've run a restaurant, you've built it up for 20 years, and now you go bankrupt. Okay, you might not be dead, but this is like a major, major impact and destruction in a person's life. And it takes years away from his life. And in that sense, you can think of it as it's cut his life short. And that there's not thinking about this altruism ingrains that and people don't even notice that that's what they're doing. Like all my focus is on there's these people who are whatever, 70 and older, they have a high death rate. We got to do something about that. Following up on uh, both of those uh, comments, Ankar, Greg, uh, if we take it for granted that that uh, the able and the young uh, shouldn't be sacrificed to uh, the old and the frail as altruism would demand. Uh, even if that's so, what is, the, what is the right way to, if you're a young person, what is the right way to be thinking about uh, how you should be uh, interacting in society and, 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 and what it means to be responsible uh, when you're dealing with other people in a situation like this? What, uh, and there's a lot of talk of social distancing, but um, is this a duty that we all now owe or how should we think about that issue? Here's one of the, the places where I think the lack of moral guidance and leadership um, by people who are highly placed in the society matters. Because how effective uh, your own action of staying in this weekend or not doing this uh, is is depends in part on coordination. It's a kind of problem of coordinated collective collective action right here. Uh, everybody doing the same thing or a policy that we all stick to and can, can see is, uh, is useful. Um, if we can could get the same kind of recommendations coming from somebody who's trying to, to vet them and encourage them at a wide scale, it would be easier to make these kinds of decisions. And in particular, if you can get political leaders recommending things. I ask you to do this until this time, and here's why, and we're giving you good information on what the situation is, then it would be a lot easier to make these kinds of decisions. And I'd be saying, I'm not convinced of this, but I think um, we ought to do, uh, if it's not too onerous and too much of sacrifice, uh, we ought to do what's being asked of us. But there's not a kind of clear-cut recommendation like that, because, and when there is, it's not coupled with good information, uh, because the people in power are, um, I think, are defaulting on this. And so we're getting these kind of very draconian regulations in some places sprung on us all of a sudden um, and uh, turns on a dime and kind of panic behavior. Um, what should you do in light of that? I think you should be trying to limit contact with people, uh, particularly with older people. Um, you should be doing it in a way that's in the hierarchy of your values. Um, you know, so I don't say don't see your grandparents, don't ever go out of the house. Um, but, you know, if you're, uh, if you're sick, uh, self-isolate because you can't find out whether you have this or not, or try to isolate as much as you can because you can't find out whether you have this or not. Um, and be in this time more, think that, you know, there's a, a cost and a risk to interacting and uh, do it less but not, not at all necessarily. And then think also about your own risk profile and the risk profile of people close to you because that's gonna be relevant, so. And, um, and I think the wider issue of, so when it's voluntary social distancing because of the load on the healthcare system, I take that seriously. I mean, that's part of my, I don't wanna get it uh, the virus, though, I'm not particularly concerned, but I have 
close ones who I think that um, because because of pre existing conditions and so on, much more susceptible to complications from this. But the, I take seriously too that the, the load on the healthcare system, it's a socialized system, but I don't think that means everybody involved in the system is bad. So I mean, certainly not the patients who go that there's um, that if their care goes down because the system's overloaded, that's a major issue. But also I take really seriously the doctors involved. Um, I view that, I mean, most of the doctors I know are passionate, dedicated people to their field. And it's not their fault that they're operating in a socialized system. And if, it's, if the system really can't cope with this, I mean, I've read stories of uh, doctors in critical condition who have died. I was reading today a story about um, the lack of equipment. They're really worried about running out of equipment and so on. Like that's a major, major loss to me of value of things that I value and admire. And if it's um, part of voluntary social distancing is doing it rationally at the margins of where you can cut out. I mean, it was, it was put earlier, cut out unnecessary travel unnecessary social gap. And I take that seriously, that you should really think about that. Um, if there is an issue, which I think there is an issue, given the current context, that the system could get overloaded. Yeah, I was talking to a friend who's an emergency department uh, physician in, uh, in New York, and they're really worried about this kind of thing. They're not being enough protective equipment. They're talking about how to double up patients on respirators if they need to do that, which is apparently possible, but not normally done. Um, and, um, you know, we need these people and we need these services intact if we get sick, either if we get this virus or, you know, you fall and you break your leg or something, you might need to go to the hospital. Uh, and so it should be in everyone's interest to try to maintain these services. It's hard to get good information about what we need to do to do that. And I'm, it's a work in progress for me to figure out what it is. Um, and, uh, but you shouldn't be indifferent to that. You should be thinking about what, you know, this is a value and then how do I factor it in with my other values? We are, and then you should be concerned about why are we in a situation why there, where there's shortages of this? Why are in hospitals able to scale? What can, be, what can be done on a policy thing to help them scale quickly? But also once we're out of this, we're going to, once we're out of, in other words, the thick of this particular crisis, there's going to be a lot of thinking about why this happened, what could be done to, to do things better in the, the, the next time and so forth. And we, what I think this shows is we need the flexibility of entrepreneurship and freedom in the medical field so that you can have scaling. I mean, there's not, you know, if Apple becomes unable to produce, you know, they get a run on an iPhone or something, um, they find a way to make more of them pretty quickly. Um, we're not, if the medical industry can't do that, if we can't get more hospital beds quickly, if we can't get more people in from other places, um, why is this industry not functioning like others? There can be short-term shortages in everything, but uh, in a field where you know that this could happen and you know that it could happen at crucial times, uh, if it was freer, insurance companies, doctors, and, and um, people who run hospitals, and the, the whole field would be... Um, thinking about how to deal with this flexibly in these kinds of situations. We uh, have shortages in medicine for the same reason there are shortages of bread in the USSR. It's a controlled economy. It's socialized largely even in America. And what I mean when I say medicine is socialized in America is not only Obamacare or this or that other recent act, it's primarily um, Medicare. Uh, that's the socialization of most of medicine in America. And these things need to be, uh, what, what those of us who are advocates of the free market need to be fighting for is the repeal of these kind of things. And we need to long-term be thinking about how they're related to the fact that we have shortages. But short-term, um, you know, we need to deal with the fact that we are in a, in a place of potential shortage. So we have about 20 minutes left. And Greg, I know you have a hard stop at that point. Uh, I thought maybe a good way to start to, to wrap up the discussion uh, would be to take a step back even further into, and I know neither of you are uh, psychologists, but I bet there are people who'd like to hear what you have to say about this anyway. Um, we talked about how there's a lot of fear of the unknown, 
circulating right now. Um, I suspect that there are many people in our audience who are afraid of the, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, not necessarily about the virus itself. If not that, then about the government or about the, uh, uh, the crazy hoarders and uh, not being able to get toilet paper or what have you. Um, can you recommend any psychological strategies for uh, dealing with this kind of situation, how to think about facing this kind of fear? Uh, I mean, uh, people asking questions about, uh, you know, is there going to be a dictatorship that comes out of this? I have another person asking, are there any positives that could come out of this? Do you have any general thoughts on how to handle this kind of situation psychologically? I have two. One is recognize that there are a lot of good people in the world doing good work now, including heroic work to deal with this crisis. That includes a lot of the people in the medical profession, including people in some cases who work in organizations that shouldn't exist, but who went into those because that's the place where you can fight disease and they're doing their best to fight it and uh, they're developing diseases they're you know do uh, sorry uh, medicines or researching them and doing the best they can but also think of all the other areas of our life that are impacted um, by this and all the people who are doing a tremendous work to facilitate that so I have some friends and I uh, mutual friends with all of you here who uh, are running um, a, a chain of uh, Montessori schools and I was speaking to them this weekend and they're pivoting on a dime it's um incredible to uh virtual education figuring out how to do daycare and home care in small groups um this is the kind of flexibility that um you know we need to see uh in in more of education we don't have much of it in education because education is another socialized industry but here's one field where people are you know certain companies where i know of that people are doing it um, I have a few friends in different education startups and the work they're doing is tremendous. The work of all these internet companies, we're on Zoom now, and I mean, imagine how their servers must be slammed um, and overtaxed and the thing is running perfectly and think about all those people doing that work. These are the people and these kind of people who keep us alive, uh, who keep society functioning and they're doing it at Zoom. Think about Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services is what almost all of these things are running on. Probably it's what Zoom's back end. Amazon and Jeff Bezos, these people who are vilified constantly and crapped upon and just, uh, these are the people who are saving your lives right now. And to appreciate that these people are there in the world and to value them and to recognize how good they are and how good what they do is. And, um, and, uh, that their virtue and competence and ability should give us confidence in this kind of time. And we should remember that and treat them accordingly when we're not in a crisis and they're saving our lives uh, properly. Uh, and, and think about this too, in the way people talk about the pharma industry or, or vaccines and so forth. These things are important and they're valuable and value the ones that we have, value the people who are doing the work and recognize that those people are there in the world um, um, uh, helping us. So focus on the positive that's there, including the non-obvious ones, and including all the people in all these industries who are doing this work, not just, you know, some human interest story that you'll get on TV about some kindly lady who helped her neighbor or something, but the people who are doing it at, at scale and really heroically. I mean, the kindly neighbor's nice too, but that's not what's, um, what's saving all our lives right now. And that's not what's made us rich and um, healthy and able to function uh, for all these years. And then the other one is um, it's to think really abstractly about what's going on. In a time of uncertainty where we don't know what's going to happen. Oh, someone on the, the um, I mentioned Bezos and Amazon. Someone also mentioned Gates and what they're doing in Seattle. And I already mentioned the Gates Foundation. So Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, all these people who are, are doing tremendous work. Um, but a lot of people who we don't know the names of. But also to, to think in a time of tremendous uncertainty where we don't know what concretely is going to happen. We didn't talk much about the economy, but the economy is in a really frightening place right now because of this. Um, uh, the political situation is ominous because of this. Uh, but to think, you know, when you go zoom way out, we're human beings. Human beings are capable. Problems are inevitable, but they are solvable by the application of reason, 
Reason is tremendously powerful. We are a species that's able to deal with this world. And this is a world that's able to be dealt with by us. And you in particular are a human being who's able to make a life for yourself. And a lot of really bad times can come if they do. You don't know specifically what times will come. But you know that you and other rational people are doing what you can and are the kind of creatures that can survive really bad things if they come. And so think about all the things that people have survived, weathered, made it through, and what it is about them that made that possible. And recognize that thing in yourself and in the people you know around you and elsewhere where you can find it in the world and cherish it. Um, the So uh, my nature is not to panic. And I don't have any panic about the virus. The, and it, the, my far stronger worries are about the government um, and what it's doing and the way the world thinks China's a model. Why couldn't we do it more like them and be more and can the government this kind of uh, arbitrary power? I'm much more worried about that. The idea that the virus, I have exactly the opposite perspective on it and it partly relates to some of the things that Greg was bringing up. I find it amazing that there's there's this outbreak of a new virus and they so, can so quickly identify it, sequence its um, genetics, learn, okay, it's related to this. I mean, part of, I think, what Amish is doing when he talks, it's a novel coronavirus, but there's other coronaviruses and we know stuff about them. And so, and we can relate it to that. And you it's not some alien thing that's come and who knows how to deal with it. And if you think wider in terms of history, the kinds of disease and destruction at, that results from it that people have had to deal with, and they can cope, it's not very pleasant, but they can cope from the flu, uh, the Spanish flu epidemic to, I mean, it's fairly recently that we have antibiotics so easily available and what life was like, I mean, prior to the 1940s with the, no antibiotics and the way that life was just saturated with disease all the time. Um, it's, we live in, it's unbelievable what, the, what we're able to do health-wise. And yes, this is, it's concerning. It seems more deadly than the flu. You should learn about it just as you should learn about the flu and steps you can take to try to avoid it. And, and there's a vaccine and it, you don't have this kind of mentality of being anti-vaccines. But the idea that there's some, from the, the medical point of view, some reason to panic, I, just, I find it exactly the reverse. I mean, who, who could cope better with this kind of thing? And these kinds of things happened and have happened throughout human history than us now with all the knowledge and even with, with medicine socialized and so on. It's still able to do all kinds of things. Um, so I'm much more worried about the government wielding arbitrary power and people's attitude towards governments wielding arbitrary power. Yeah, and think about this in light of the non-crazy bad case scenarios. So two million Americans die. I don't mean to just just talk about Americans, but I'm in America and that's a number I, I read recently. That's very bad. It would be a horror. But it's, what is it in comparison to the annual death rate? It's a doubling of the annual death rate. That's very bad. But it's not 10% of the population. Is, it's not like a, 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 a you know, potentially society-ending event. If you think about it, you know, you've had years where one or two people you knew have died and years where you've had four or five people you know who've died, right? And the, the latter are much worse years but they don't destroy your life. Um, and uh, particularly not to, you know, uh, be dismissive about the aged and infirm, but these are people who were likely to die soon anyway. So what we're talking about is people who would have died three years from now, die this year rather than three years from now. And we have fewer deaths three years from now and more this year. It, it's bad, but it's not, this is what's going to usher in Armageddon. Um, and if it does, usher in really bad consequences. They're going to be from how we react to it. They're going to be from things like hospitals being overloaded, 
uh, and, and maybe making poor decisions about how to deal with that. They're going to be from economic catastrophe that happens from shutting down all kinds of businesses and making unemployment jump to ridiculous amounts all of a sudden and ruining people's businesses when they're not, they're not you know, able to reopen because they don't have capital. But, uh, and that can be a real catastrophe and horror. But the underlying fundamentals of, that make the economy possible are not going to go away unless freedom does in a long-term way. And um, so it's not going to be like there's no way to get the economy going again. Um, so I think the, the bigger longer term threat uh, is from a government reaction to this and from the disease itself. But even that, um, I don't think, I mean, you know, you have to think about the worst case scenarios, but I don't think it's, uh, it's time to panic. And I think there's going to be an occasion after this, as there is after every crisis, to do a lot of rethinking about what's going on, what's the direction the world is going in, why are things the way they are? And I think those of us who are concerned about the long term, who are concerned about medicine and so forth, have to take this as an opportunity to do that. And that includes a lot of things. It includes um, the kind of political and philosophical issues we were talking about, the role of force in, in our lives and in the economy, and particularly in medicine and how it's stifling the mind. But also, just more concretely, we've known for a long time that we're in a situation where a pandemic can emerge. And we've known that we are not, at least the doctors who study this, who I've spoken to about it, I have AMESH in mind in particular, have known that we're not as prepared as we could and should be for this kind of thing. And this is not a worst case scenario virus. This is not something with a very high mortality. It's higher than the flu, it's bad but it's not um, astronomically higher than the flu. Um, and it spreads efficiently, but not like measles efficiently, where you know if one person in the subway car has it, everybody else has it uh, a minute later. Um, in a way, we're fortunate that this event has happened to wake everybody up to the seriousness of this kind of medical threat. And um, we will be able to weather this one. The question is, what do we do um, to prepare for this kind of thing in the future so that we're not caught so off guard? And I think there's going to be a real battle about that in the years to come. It's going to be a battle within the medical profession, and it's going to be a battle within philosophy and politics about how to understand the ethics of this, how to understand um, uh, what the politi right political principles are. And we all need to be thinking a lot more about that. We need to be understanding this case better than we do, including, you know, better than we here do. Uh, and there needs to be a lot of research and thought devoted to um, how to understand these kinds of issues, the government's proper role in it, uh, both what should be done in crisis times when they happen, but also how, um, what the moral way for this part of human life, medicine and disease response to function is, so that we are not caught uh, flat-footed in crisis without knowing what to do. And I think um, I I'm certainly planning to think a lot more about this and work on this in the years to come in different ways. I already had plans about this prior to um, this pandemic becoming an issue. I'll, I'll talk more about them in some other context. I'm, I'm uh, hopeful that the Ayn Rand Institute will be you know, spending time having some of other people here think about these kinds of cases. Um, and uh, I think this is something we're going to really need to dedicate ourselves uh, as philosophers and advocates for a free society uh, in the future. And I think people in the medical field will. But we're lucky that this, in, in the interview between uh, Amy Shadalzer and Sam Harris, uh, Sam Harris asked if this was the you know, big one or a dress rehearsal. And it's a dress rehearsal. Let's, uh, let's take it seriously and then uh, mm -hmm. learn the lessons from this. And let's work together to do that. Yeah, I've I was just uh, last night uh, uh, taking a look again at We the Living, and you know the first, and this is of course Ayn Rand's semi autobiographical novel that's set uh, in the Soviet Union right after the the revolution. And of course, the first famous line of the book is Petrograd smelt of carbolic acid, and that's because uh, there was a typhoid epidemic going throughout the Soviet Union right after the war. Three million people died from that. Kira is not so much worried about typhus, though. The main character of the book 
she's she's worried about the fact that uh, she's being locked airtight uh, in in this in this communist dictatorship. Uh, and to go back to your point, Greg, about I think both of you made a version of this point about what people have uh, been able to do uh, in the face of this kind of adversity. Well, Kira, of course, is is still able to find uh, a sense of wonder in everything that's possible, even when she's, you know, living in a Soviet dictatorship. And of course, Ayn Rand, who, whose life this was the basis of, uh, was able to do the same thing. And importantly, she was able to get out. Uh, but I don't and, think we're at the point of thinking, how can we maintain a benevolent outlook on the world even when we're locked in airtight so we can't function, right? I mean... Well, my point was that we should, we should make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, the essential way that we survive is by reason, including in a medical crisis. It's what's keeping us alive now. It's what's keeping us able to communicate and share information, though many of us are in social isolation now. It's what's making there be food on the table. It's what's making um, these antivirals available. It's what's causing the, has caused the respirators that are saving the people who have serious cases of this, saving their lives now to exist, and what made them able to be in the right places at the right time and to continue operating. And insofar as we're handling this badly, it's through lack of enough application of reason and I think actually, importantly, through lack of valuing reason. And uh, what reason requires to function is freedom. So I think the if you're talking about the ph philosophical and political response to this long term, it's understanding really deeply how this concrete case, how the concrete privations and problems we're having here stem from the lack of valuing reason and freedom I don't mean saying it as a platitude, but really taking and not jumping on the first thing that seems like an example of it and trumpeting that, but really doing the research to understand it. And then to make that clear, both the principle to people and how the principle applies in this kind of case. And that's what we need to do long term going forward. What we need to do short term is keep our heads, identify the people who are keeping their heads uh, and um, are applying reason and follow their advice as best we can in, in context with our own, uh, with our own values. Any final thoughts, Ankar? Um, so what we didn't get into, which is the economic uncertainty and interventions, um, the fact that we didn't get into it doesn't mean this is not a major, major issue. And it's so the, the meltdown in the market, um, this you see this kind of thing happen, particularly in periods of uncertainty. Um, and here it's largely caused by us, by our government. And you, one should take that really seriously and think about that. Think about who you think are proper representatives. I mean, we have elections coming up. This is a major, so 9-11, that's an outside attack, even though there's all kinds of screw ups that led to that attack that we could have prevented. But, it's, but here it's, um, it's a virus, but it's our response to it and the lack of clarity of what we're doing has caused uh, incredible uncertainty. And if you don't know, like, are we gonna be shut down for three months? And so You can function. You businesses, even if they don't have a lockdown, it, this is an incredibly difficult environment in which to function. And that is, um, it doesn't have to be that way. And if you just, I mean, the Fed, that the, they reduced rates by one percentage um, so that they took it down to zero from about 1%. That doesn't happen very often. And for that, was this political? So, I mean, for a few days before Trump's threatening um, and the Fed's supposed to be independent. And he's threatening, well, I don't like what you're doing. And so, on. so was this done because they think they need to do it or was done because um, the pressure Trump is putting on? It was done on a Sunday. The result was, oh, the Fed's panicking. Like they don't, they have to do it before the market opens. And so, and this is like, this is massive destruction and it doesn't have to be like this. Um, so the fact that we didn't talk about that aspect that much, it's, this is crucial. And it's part of the, the environment that people now are 
like what's next and they and they don't know how to function and i suspect that we will we will have to talk about that next week because this will still this will still be with us then and hopefully we'll have more sessions like this and we'll be able to bring on other people who are experts in economics in uh, in medicine, in other fields that are relevant to understanding this. There are a number of people who've been asking uh, what, uh, where to find the recording of the session we've just had, and uh, it is immediately available on each of our social media platforms where it's currently live streaming, and the recording will be there right as soon as you look on YouTube, Facebook, and on Periscope. We may edit it a little bit to take out the empty 10 minutes at the beginning, but uh, otherwise it will stay intact. I have every reason to think it will. Um, we've had a really big turnout today with so many questions coming in. I haven't been able to handle them, um, but I think there were a lot of good ones. And, and we hope to see you again in the future, as I think we will continue to uh, cover and comment on this ongoing issue. Uh, thank you, Ankar. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye.